Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. I have joining me on the program today, Bill Solis. He's an end times expert, an author of many books, documentaries. Bill is joining us today to talk about the future wars. He was with me a couple of months ago talking about his new book, The Future War Prophecies. Well, what we've seen now is those wars have begun. And so we're gonna be talking today about Psalm 83 war, which we're seeing the beginnings of right now. All the different wars prophesied to happen in the relatively near future before the tribulation. Bill is going to be talking about all of that. We're going to be talking about the tribulation. Everything that's going to be happening prophetically, especially as it relates to Israel and the wars that are going on right now, stay tuned. This is an exciting show. Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. I'm excited today to have joining me best selling author and end times expert Bill Solis. Bill is the founder of Prophecy Depot Ministries. He's written many books about the end times, produced 14 DVDs, and he's an author and speaker I've learned a lot from over the years. And I'm very glad to have him joining me today because we're talking about the war in Israel and the prophetic implications of it. We're specifically talking today about Bill's new book. The Future War Prophecies. Bill, thank you so much for joining me today. And we're going to be talking about your book, The Future War Prophecies. And you were on the show a couple of months ago, and we were talking about this. But today, this is happening right before our eyes, isn't it? It really is. We had talked about the prophecies that we thought would be coming fairly soon. Now we think they're coming even sooner now in light of what's going on in the Gaza, like Psalm 83, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, Isaiah 17, the destruction of Damascus, uh, probably even Jeremiah chapter 49, dealing with the disaster in Elam. On a modern day map, you, you would have Elam, which hugs the Persian Gulf, and you have Persia, which is the other portion of Iran. So we're looking at prophecies written several thousand years ago that are stage setting and about to unfold in my estimation, Jim. Uh, and you, you talk about God's peace plan and I, I want you to go through this because we're going to talk about the Psalm 83 war, which really is unfolding right now. Um, and you wrote a book on that back in 2013, 2014. I did, absolutely. Psalm 83, the missing prophecy revealed how Israel becomes the next Mideast superpower. And, and we're going to talk about that war that is really happening right now. Let's, let's talk about God's peace plan. Now, related to the Mideast peace, the Biden administration uh, I'm thankful for the military support the United States is giving Israel. This war probably would have been escalated beforehand without all the military presence of the United States. However, the Biden administration is pushing hard for a two-state solution. So why, why is that important? Right. Well, he's following the same failed footsteps of his predecessor. Clinton, of course, tried to do it in 2000 at the Camp David summit with Ehud Barak, the then Prime Minister of Israel, and Yasser Arafat. Of course, Yasser Arafat walked out when so much was offered, but he didn't accept it. And then, of course, George Bush tried the same thing in 2005, and and uh, even Obama with John Kerry in 2014. Matter of fact, they introduced this peace plan that we're going to talk about in Jeremiah chapter 12 uh, at that time in April 2014 on the Daystar program with Marcus and Joni, and she'd asked me because uh, there was negotiations going on with Sean Kerry and uh, Mahmoud Abbas for the Palestinians, and Netanyahu, of course. And uh, she said, "What would I tell John Kerry in light of what's going on?" And this was, the, of course, after that show that those peace talks fell apart like a two weeks later, as I anticipated they would. So what we talk about here in the next moments are going to be uh, what God had planned for the Middle East peace plan, knowing of all the conflicts that were inevitable to happen, foreknowing what was forthcoming. And I think it's important that everyone should understand because right now Joe Biden is, of course, trying to promote the two-state solution. He always did, but after what happened with the massacre with Hamas and, and what was going on there, the brutality, of course, he sort of put that on the shelf because, of course, you wouldn't want to talk about that right now. You wouldn't want to necessarily give land to the enemies of Israel right now. But, of course, he would, at this point, he's moving back into that direction. You're seeing the headlines starting to talk more and more about the two-state solution. That is the only solution they believe will work. But that's not the point. God has a solution that will work and is already in process. Is that found in Jeremiah? Yeah, Jeremiah chapter 12, it's a two-part uh, two peace plan. The first part, this is written about 590 B.C. 
Now God, knowing the end from the beginning, foreknew that when the Jews would come back into the land, he, he promised he would restore the Jews back to the land of Israel. 1878 years elapsed from 70 AD to 1948 AD. But in that period of time, God knew that when the Jews came back into the land, there would be a problem because the, what he had witnessed firsthand, the ancient hatred that stemmed way back at the time of Abraham when he went back with Hagar versus Sarah, or the mothers, they had a conflict together. You had Ishmael versus Isaac, the sons had a conflict. This is ancient hatred started to develop, the grandsons. You had Esau versus Jacob. Then you had the, the cousins, the Moab and Ammon, which would be modern day Jordan and the Hebrews, even the grandson Amalek against the Hebrews. God witnessed that ancient hatred that got, continued to be incubated throughout the Middle East from time immemorial. And he knew that it would be alive and well when the Jews came back into the land with his foreknowledge. So he had to put together a, a but not only alive and well, but and now deeply embedded into a Jew-hating, violent religion of Islam. And of course, we've seen that happen ever since Israel became back in the land in 1948. So he knew that was going to be the case, but he's a very compassionate God, Jimmy. And you're going to see in his plan here, He's so long suffering that he wishes, of course, none would perish. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Even those who were worshiping the false god of Allah. And we're going to read about his compassion for them. Uh, but they all would have put their faith in him and have eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's our that's our God that we serve, Jimmy. Yeah. So he knew he'd have to do a resettlement plan. This is the ultimate land for peace plan. And he told Jeremiah how this would work. Of course, everyone's out of compliance with it. The politicians don't know about it. But we're going to tell them, like we, I did on Marcus and Joni in 2014 on your show, what God's plan is. And it's already in the 20th century plan, part one, that we're going to read about has already been implemented and is effectually intact. Wow. And what it says here, thus says the Lord against my evil neighbors. Now notice that, neighbors in the neighborhood, he's calling them evil, not calling them good. Uh, who touched the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit. Of course, that's the promised land. Behold, I will pluck them out of their land and pluck out the house of Judah from among them. And we'll stop there. Evil neighbors, they got to be resettled. These are Arabs who were living in what was formerly called Palestine. He's going to pluck them out. Forceful language. They're not going to go voluntarily. He's going to pluck them out. He's going to move them back into the lands of their heritage. And he's also going to take the Jews who are going to come into the land of Israel and take them out of those Arab lands and Persian lands of Iran. And he's going to move the Jews into, and he says he's going to pluck them out also, meaning forceful language for them as well, not necessarily wanting to go voluntarily, a lot of them. So we find out that in the 20th century, God had already made sovereign moves in that direction. And what we find out after the Ottoman Empire lost in World War One and it collapsed after 400 years of reign over the Middle East from 1517 to 1917, that all of a sudden now the Arab states start to get their statehood good again. God is going to bring the Arabs back into their states. He's going to have compassion on them, take them back to their heritage. We find out in 1922, you had Egypt was regained its statehood. We find out in 1932, Saudi Arabia and Iraq got their statehood. So we see gods and works here doing the sovereign act. 1935, Persia was became Iran, formerly called Persia. Uh, 1943, Lebanon got its statehood. 1946, Jordan and Syria. And then, of course, now it's Israel's turn in 1948. Now, actually, Israel should have been the first state to get a statehood back in 1917, but the British Empire uh, didn't have that happen with the Balfour Declaration. And, of course, at that time, the sun always used to set on the British Empire. They controlled about a fifth of the world's landmass and about a sovereignty over about a quarter of the Earth's population. But in 70 years from that time up until their decline, the sun always sets on the British Empire at this point in time because they did not do what they were supposed to do in 1917. And they subjected the Jewish people to the Holocaust, and six million of them, of course, were exterminated by Hitler. So World War I prepared the land for the people, and World War II prepared the people for the land. Wow. So God put all this together, he put all the statehoods together like he said he would, He would, and he's going to pluck these Arabs out, and he did, and he brought them back into their statehood, and he's bringing the Jews back into their place. And it goes on to say in verse 15, Then it shall be after I have plucked them out, then I will return and have compassion on them, and bring them back, everyone to his heritage and everyone to his land. Everyone, not just the Jew, but the Jew and the Gentile, the Arabs, 
to their heritage and you have compassion on them. This is the compassionate plan that God had, a land for peace still extraordinaire, a resettlement plan that God had put in, in, in the lips of Jeremiah's prophecy back 590 B.C. But he goes on to say, and this, this all happened in the 20th century, like I said. In the 21st century, now here's what we've got in store, what's forthcoming at this point in time. The only thing God asked after giving them their statehood was ins inscribed in Jeremiah 12, verses 15 and 16. And it says, And it shall be that if they will learn carefully the ways of my people, speaking about the evil neighbors, to swear by my name, not Allah, not the false God, but, but Jehovah, as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, the false God, during Jeremiah's time, Baal, the Jews were worshiping Baal, and they were actually sacrificing their children to this false god, Baal. So God says, if you will worship my name, like you taught my children back at Jeremiah's time to worship Baal, then then they shall be established in the midst of my people. So the, the plan was to establish the Arabs in the midst of the Jewish people, let them have their heritage lands, have compassion on them, have their statehood. All God asked after he set all that up in the 20th century was that they would worship him. And I think that was a fair request after all he's done for them. But they don't. They're not worshiping him. They're worshiping not the one true God of Jehovah, but they're worshiping the false God of Allah. And that's a violent thing they're doing to the Jewish people, as yeah. we see. He goes on to say this, and I'll conclude. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. Utter destruction of nations, Jimmy. And that's where you get into the Psalm 83 and the Israeli Defense Forces existing in fulfillment of Bible prophecy to fight off the Arabs. And we see them going to task right now in the Gaza, Jimmy. Who are the evil neighbors that Jeremiah is talking about? We have to look at the roundabout in the neighborhood there. You have, and they're all identified in Psalm 83. Uh, they got their statehood we talked about. You have Lebanon to the north. Uh, it listed as Tyre or Gabal in Psalm 83, verses 6 through 8. And that's, of course, where the Hezbollah are. Right. And, and it says in Psalm 83, it says that the inhabitants of Tyre, in other words, a, a habitation condition. And if you sort of research the word, it looks like it could be a state within a state inhabiting. And, of course, Hezbollah is a state within a state right. that was set up, a proxy group set up by Iran. So I would probably put Hezbollah is in there as part of the evil neighbors, but Lebanon is involved in there. You have Syria, where, of course, Bashar al-Assad uh, is a proxy of Iran as well, and he yeah. used chemical weapons yeah. over 300 times in the Syrian revolution. He's a threat to Israel. Uh, you also have Iraq. Uh, you have Jordan, fragile peace treaty with Jordan right now, but I can show prophecies, and I do in the future war book and the Psalm 83 book that Jordan's peace treaty will be voided out and there'll be a war. Uh, Egypt, I believe, would be in there. You have the Palestinians identified in Psalm 83, verse 6, as the tents of Edom. The Edomites have ethnical representation into the Palestinians today. The Edomites were fathered by Esau who was the twin brother of Jacob. Jacob later became called Israel. But Esau fathered the Edomites. And we're told in Psalm 83, verse 6, that there'll be the tents of Edom. They're listed first as if it's their plight that's being bannered by the 10-member Psalm 83 Confederacy. Tents of, biblically in this scenario, means refugee encampments. So we wow. have the Palestinian refugees being identified for us 3,000 years ago when Asaph wrote this prophecy. And it's, of course, their plight for the two-state solution that's being bannered, and even Joe Biden is falling into that trap. And so then you also have Saudi Arabia and the Gaza, the Felicia area, where the Hamas are, um, the Sinai area. These would be, in my estimation, the nations that share common borders with Israel, that have harbored this ancient hatred from time immemorial against Israel. And those are the nations and terrorist populations within them that the Lord is saying will utterly be plucked up and destroyed if they don't worship God like they taught the Jews to worship Baal back in Jeremiah's time. And they're not going to, Jimmy, as you can tell, they're not going to do that. They're not going to pull themselves apart from Allah. And in uh, and, and my estimation, as we see these wars start to come forward prophetically put together and to foretold, Allah is going to lose his Akbar. And, you know, that means Allah is the greater God. Well, Allah is not the greater God, and Jehovah is the, the true God. So how are they going to be plucked up, Bill? I mean, if God says that these evil neighbors are going to be plucked up, does that go back to Psalm 83? I would turn our attention to Psalm 83, but within Psalm 83, 
It, it talks about the goal of the Confederates in the first five verses. It says they want to come together. They form a crafty plan to wipe Israel off the map, to cut the nation off, that the name of Israel can be remembered no more. It says they form a confederacy against the Jewish people, against God's people. Excuse me, God's people. Then it goes on in Psalm 83, verses 6 through 8, and identifies who they are, which we just did, the evil neighbors. They've got their states that are not worshiping God as they're supposed to. They're out of compliance with God's peace plan. They will utterly be plucked up and destroyed. Then Asaph goes on through verses 9 through 18 to conclude the psalm and petitions to God. Uh, he would uh, encourage him to respond to this belligerent Confederate attempt to wipe Israel off the map. And we see that the peripheral prophecies that we can get into to talk about the Israeli Defense Forces fighting off these evil neighbors, destroying these populations in these countries, like for instance Isaiah 17. Damascus will cease from being a city, it will be a ruinous heap, it will be reduced to rubble. Jeremiah 49 verses 2, there will be alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites, that's Ammon Jordan, and it shall be a desolate mound, and Israel shall take possession of his inheritance, which is the Promised Land. So the Israeli Defense Forces are in a number of peripheral prophecies that would be a direct response to Asaph's petition as to how to empower the Israeli Defense Forces to win the wars and destroy those enemies of Israel. And I can get into the examples he used, but I don't think that's necessary at this point of the show, because I want to draw our attention to Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2, which says, The time is coming when these evil neighbors will make a final siege on Judah and Jerusalem. It says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling or dizziness or intoxication in some translations unto all the people round about, the evil neighbors, when they when they try to lay siege on both against Judah and Jerusalem. So we're going to find out there'll be a final siege attempt on Judah and Jerusalem. Of course, they think Jerusalem is the third holiest city in Islam, even though it's not mentioned one time in the Quran. But they think it's the third holy city in Islam. Of course, that's where the Temple Mount is. And Jordan has control over that. So right. uh, right. they're going to take a final siege on that. And what's going to happen is the Lord's going to intervene. And we're told in Zechariah 12, verses 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, that the Lord is going to intervene supernaturally. He's going to level the playing field. I get into the, the, the things that are going to happen. If time permits, we can go over them in this show. But he's going to inter divinely intervene and work in concert with the Israeli Defense Forces. And when he levels the playing field, we're told in Zechariah 12, verse 5, that the Israeli Defense Forces are going to be gaining so much confidence because they've seen that the, that the Lord has divinely intervened on their behalf. And it, what ultimately what it says, and I'll read Zechariah 12, verse 6. <clears throat> it says, In that day, in that day that they try to lay a final siege on Judah and Jerusalem, the countries round about, the evil neighbors, I'll make the governors or the captains read that as the Israeli defense forces of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile and like a fiery torch of sh in the sheaves and they shall devour all the surrounding peoples, all the evil neighbors on the right hand and on the left hand. And of course, all those countries we listed are on the right hand and on the left hand of Israel, the nations round about, the evil neighbors. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again and in its own place, Jerusalem. So they're going to try to take Jerusalem away from Jewish sovereignty. They're going to try to have a Palestinian state. That's the goal of Psalm 83. They don't want a two-state solution. They want a state called Palestine. They don't want an Israel. Two-state solution will not work. It'll play into the hands of the enemies of Israel. That's right. And ultimately, Jerusalem will be inhabited by the Jewish people. And that's when Israel can dwell securely, which is a prerequisite for Ezekiel 38. Hey, before we go to the next question with Bill, and I hope you're enjoying this because this is intriguing concerning what's happening in Israel. I just want you to know we have endtimes.com. That is our full website where we have all of our podcasts, all of our articles, everything that we do to keep you up to date on what's happening in the world, Bible prophecy, what's happening in Israel. If you haven't subscribed yet, go to endtimes.com, $7 a month. You can be a subscriber and you get everything that we do. And this is a time right now in world history where we need to stay encouraged, we need to stay informed, and this is what we're there for. If you haven't subscribed yet, go to endtimes.com, $7 a month, become a subscriber. So do you think, and I want to put on the screen because you were talking about prophecies involving the Israeli Defense Forces, and we don't have to go through all of these specifically, but we're going to put on the screen here, there's Is Israeli Defense Forces versus Iran, that's Jeremiah 49, versus Syria, 
Isaiah 17, Jeremiah 49 versus Hamas, uh, Zephaniah, or, you know, Zephaniah 2, 4, Ezekiel, then Psalms 83, Palestinians, Hezbollah, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the hostile neighbors. And so all of these prophecies are there, which you see conflict with many of them right now with the IDF, and the ones that aren't in conflict today are rattling the sword, including Jordan. Jordan's disposition toward is Israel has changed dramatically in the last three weeks. And so they did have kind of a pseudo peace, but now they've, they've changed their disposition a lot. So this, this is all prophesied. So Bill, let me ask you this, this question. And I want to talk about the tribulation and pre-tribulation prophecies. So you believe that what we're witnessing right now is the beginning of the Psalm 83 war? I think there's three things I'm watching pretty closely, Jimmy. Uh, I think they will ultimately culminate in the utter destruction of those nations that are out of compliance with God's peace plan in Jeremiah chapter 12. And I, I think the, the sequence of events, and I could have this off, but I think it's going to be involving a war with Syria and a war with Iran. Iran, of course, will call on their proxies, Hezbollah. They've already got Hamas into the fray, of course. Right. Uh, Syria and uh, the Houthis, of course, have also lobbed a missile at Israel at this point. Shiite militias in Iraq. Uh, the Jeremiah chapter 49 prophecy of Elam talks about a disaster on the west coast of Iran, written in 596, by C 596 BC by Jeremiah. It says that there's going to be a time coming, and I believe that time is now, where the Lord is fiercely angry with the leaders of Iran because he says he's going to destroy from there the kings and the princes. And the reason that he's angry with them, and he's going to bring about a disaster, the prophecy talks about, in that area on the west coast of Iran, is because they want to launch something lethal somewhere, and I believe that would be uh, at Israel. And it says this, he's going to break the bow of Elam at the foremost of their might, so they won't be able to do that. Now, one of the things is we're watching this conflict with Hamas going on. We're not hearing anything about Iran's nuclear program. We're not hearing about IAEA, IAEA inspectors going in and saying, hey, listen, we've got Iran in check. They're not they're building their nuclear weapons. Well, two weeks prior to the conflict, uh, on October 7th with the Gaza and Hamas, we were told that Iran was two weeks away from having all the f enough sufficient fissile materials right. to make a nuclear weapon. Yeah. So in my estimation, Iran is moving fast forward in turbo mode to get not one, but maybe multiple nuclear weapons. Maybe one of the reasons they're not calling on their proxies to go full throttle uh, in this Hamas-Israel war just yet. I mean, I'm speculating, but I think they are moving in a rapid direction to get a nuclear weapon. But the prophecy says he will break the bow at the foremost of their might, so they can't launch the, their nuclear weapons, apparently at Israel, is what I'm thinking of the concern is. And when we look at what's going on in Iran, that west coast, that Elam territory, which hugs the Persian Gulf, it is where Iran's got all of its underground missile silos, portable rocket launchers, its underground air base, its intercontinental ballistic missiles, which can hit Israel in 400 seconds, which is 6.66 minutes. They can put nuclear warheads on those. It's where all their missile defense systems are, of course. That's the closest place to Israel. And, of course, it's the closest place to defend Iran proper from Israel and any other enemies. So that prophecy I'm watching for, it could happen before Isaiah 17. But Isaiah 17 could also happen, which talks about Isaiah 17.1 says, the burden against Damascus, it shall cease from being a city, it will be a ruinous heap. And we're told that, that is caused by the children of Israel. We're told in Isaiah 17, verse 9, that in that day when Damascus ceases from being a city, it will be as a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children in Israel, of Israel, and there will be desolation because of the children of Israel. The Israeli Defense Forces in Isaiah 17, 14 says, then behold, at eventide trouble, and in before the morning he, speaking of Damascus, in the masculine pronoun, in the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. Remember, they're going to try to lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem, ultimately. They're going to try to rob and plunder. But Damascus will be destroyed. Matter of fact, Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 25, asks a rhetorical question, also dealing with the destruction of Damascus, I think, from a different camera angle. It says, why is the city of my praise not destroyed, but your city, Damascus, is desolated? I'm paraphrasing. Why is Jerusalem not destroyed, but Damascus is going to be destroyed overnight? So one night we're going to see Damascus, 
but in the morning we're not going to see it anymore. And Israel has the type of weaponry, probably a tactical nuclear weapon, to take out a city overnight. And they have to be careful where they launch it, the burst altitude, so that they don't bring up the mushroom clouds with all the contaminated particles. But they know what, what burst altitude to launch a tactical nuclear weapon to take out a city, but not have that uh, debris and the wind patterns blow it back into Tel Aviv and that sort of thing. You're saying that all of this, the Psalm 83 war, Jeremiah 49, Isaiah 17 is pre-tribulation? Is that what you're saying? I am, because when you look at the, understand the two compartments of the tribulation, seven-year tribulation, the first three and a half years, these Israeli defense forces are very inoperable. Uh, they feel that they're in a peaceful mode because of Daniel 9.27 and Isaiah 28.15. talks about a covenant that gets confirmed by the Antichrist with Israel and the many Isaiah says the many is death in Sheol, so in my, some of my books I put a face on who that is, but the point is they get a covenant. It's a seven-year covenant, Daniel 9.27 talks about it as well, but in the mid part of that seven-year period, at the three-and-a-half-year point, it gets violated as the Antichrist goes into the Jewish temple, which will be standing at that time, and desecrates it. And Jesus says in Matthew 24.15, when you see that abomination of desolation, spoken by Daniel in the holy place. He tells the Jewish people to flee, and he tells them to flee to the mountains, which we find out, and I pinpoint the location in my future War Prophecies book. The location is in southern Jordan of the Petra area. So in the first half, they're not fighting anybody because they're living in peace. Matter of fact, they're so complacent, they can't even stop the Antichrist from going into the temple and desecrating it at the mid part of the trip. So they're not fighting. The Israeli Defense Forces is inoperable in the first half. In the second half, they're inoperable because they're fleeing for their lives because the Antichrist is going to come out of the temple. He's going to try to commit genocide of the Jews, and according to Zechariah 13.8, two-thirds of the Jewish people in the land will be cut off, but Zechariah 13.9 says, but one-third, a faithful remnant, will come through that, that tribulational period. And they'll call for Jesus Christ to return at the second coming. They'll say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, fulfilling Matthew 23. And he will come for them, and he will rescue them, and he will destroy the Antichrist and his armies at that point in time. So they're not fighting in the first half, they're not fighting in the second half. They're not fighting in the millennium because we're told in Micah 4 that the Lord Jesus Christ will turn the spears into uh, plowshares and the, pruning, the, the swords into plowshares, the spears into pruning forks, pruning hooks, and they shall not learn war anymore. So they're not fighting in the tribulation, they're not fighting in the millennium, so they have to fight before the tribulation, Jimmy, and that's what we're seeing happening already right now. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel 37.10 says that the Jews will come out of the Holocaust and become an exceedingly great army, yeah. and that's what we're going to start to witness here. We have the wars that need to happen before the tribulation begins, and by the way, I want to mention again your future war prophecy book. You talk about all of this. You were on the show a couple of months ago and we were talking about all this. But October 7th, this is now. I mean, you, you see unprecedented anti-Semitism in the world right now. And anti-Semitism is a requirement for the end to happen. You know, and, and especially, and I want to talk about the Antichrist in just a minute in the Covenant of Peace. I want to talk about that again. Psalm 83 is this war of the immediate neighbors of Israel, these evil neighbors. And we see that unfolding right now. We don't know exactly when it's all going to happen, but it's part of it's happening right now. Jeremiah 49 is a strike on Elam. This is the area, Bill, I just don't know how much longer Israel can wait before they have to, it has to be preemptive. They can't wait to be struck by a nuclear weapon. They're, they're just too small, they're too vulnerable. And so, I, I mean, personally, and I've been saying this now for several years because there's been talk about how soon, you know, Iran would get a nuclear weapon, but it just seems as though they're very close uh, by all estimations. But then you have the Jeremiah 49, then you have the Isaiah 17 where Damascus, Damascus is a trafficking spot right now for Iran. Uh, Israel's bombing uh, Damascus just about every day because of the Iranian activity there. Uh, it's Grand Central Station for all the bad actors that are coming into that area of the world. And so uh, those wars, and then Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is a massive war that God himself wins. And so all of that happens. So, and I know that we don't talk about, we don't set dates 
But it seems to me like, Bill, one of the ways that I said this, since October 7th, I just don't think you're going to put this genie back in the bottle. There, I just, now, there will be an Antichrist that comes, and this, this, this covenant of peace is going to supposedly, for a period of time, solve the problem. And he's going to be the answer man. He's going to be the, the, the new Messiah. But between now and then, do you see an escalation in all of this? Well, it's going to escalate. Is it going to escalate in the near future? I kind of agree with you. This Gaza thing is probably going to catalyze into something much deeper and prophetic implications. Israel is attacking Syria. They have been for quite some time. They are now also having skirmishes with Hezbollah to the north, and they also took out a inbound missile from the Houthis, another proxy of Iran way down in Yemen. So they're involved in this, but it's it's at this point it's you know, kind of cross-town rivalries rather than a full-on biblical war. But they're ultimately going to be in the biblical wars fulfilling these prophecies. The question is how soon. And in light of what's going on with Hamas right now, I would have to suggest that's going to be very soon. And I don't think, like you said, you can, the Pandora's box has been opened. You can't put that genie back in the bottle. You know, they're talking about a ceasefire. The world's clamoring for a ceasefire in the Gaza, more than any humanitarian aid. And Egypt's coming out saying... You know, we don't want any of these refugees. There will be a declaration of war. That was General Sisi said that. Right. Just recently, Jordan came out and said, we do not want any Palestinian refugees to come into our territory as well. There would also be a declaration of war. An ambassador just said that as we filmed this show. In fact, I think we have a prophecy. I want to read it to you, your viewers real quickly. That's interesting that they want to trap these Palestinians at the border. Okay, they want to keep them... They, they're like pawns. They, they fulfill an important role for these Arab states. They don't want these Palestinian refugees back in their countries, which, by the way, in God's Middle peace plan, those Palestinians were supposed to go back to their homelands. But the Arab states who got their statehood decided it was better to keep them deployed as refugees on inside of Israel and around the, the general region out there in the West Bank, the Gaza, etc. But here's what it says in Obadiah 1.7. I think it's very relevant right now to what you hear Egypt and Jordan saying, who, by the way, have those fragile peace treaties with Israel, and I right. point out in the future right. war book, those are going to be gone shortly. It says here, Obadiah 1.7, all the men in your confederacy, I believe that would be the Psalm 83 confederacy, all the men shall force you to the border, the border of Israel, in my estimation. The men at peace with you, the Psalm 83 confederacy, the evil neighbors, shall deceive you and prevail against you. They, those who eat bread with you shall lay a trap for you, no one is aware of it. So in other words, I believe it's a trap. Now, I don't believe the Arab states realize it's a trap, but God's saying it's a trap because they got nowhere to go. Right. And then the Arabs aren't going to let them back into their land. So I think we have another prophecy to be watching right there, Obadiah, Obadiah 1-7. The men in the Confederacy will keep you at the border. And I think we're seeing that going on as well. So Ezekiel 38, um, and this is, this is, there's a lot of discussion about Ezekiel 38. So the preconditions, talk about Ezekiel 38. Now, the war has to be over. The first three and a half years of the tribulation are peace. Uh, and so when the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war happens, uh, what are the preconditions for that? Right, and let me clarify something just before we skip to this topic. Because um, I think the stage gets set for Ezekiel 38 after the Israel wins wars, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But when we talk about the peace covenant, a, a lot of people think it's a peace between the Arabs and the Jews, a politically brokered peace deal that's going to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. I don't subscribe to that. That's I don't find anywhere in the Bible that it says that, not in Daniel 9.27, not Isaiah 28 verses, verses 15 and 18, the two main proof text passages. But I do believe it is that that conflict is going to end militarily, and that's what the Israeli Defense Forces are going to be involved right. in, utterly plucking up those nations. But what I do believe, and I put three clues forward in my Last Prophecies book, which is Last Prophecies, the first three and a half years of the Tribulation, what I do put forward is that the Jews are going to draft, get involved in this false covenant, not realizing it's a false covenant, because they want to build their temple. It's going to facilitate their ability to build their, their temple. I put three clues forward as to why that's the case. I'll give you just a couple of them real quickly. Uh, one of them we're told in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 4 or 5 in there, the first half of the tribulation, the first thing that John's doing, representing the Jewish people, is he's measuring the, the inner court and the outer court. 
He said, well, don't measure the outer court, that's for the Gentiles, but measure the inner court and those who worship there. So he's, he's measuring a temple, which would be the case, you do that immediately if you have the ability to do that once the covenant has been confirmed. Also, Isaiah 28, verses 16 and 17. Isaiah 28, 15 talks about the covenant. It says, you'll make a covenant with death, you'll be in agreement with Sheol, so that when the overflowing scourge passes through, whatever that's going to be, and I put a face on that in my books, uh, it will not come over you. You, you may sign on this in fault, lies and falsehood. In other words, it's politically expedient for the Jews to sign this covenant so they can build their temple. They want to build their temple because they think that that will hasten the coming of the Messiah because they don't realize Jesus already came as the Messiah. They think it's going to bring the Messiah and he's going to take care of that overflowing scourge and usher them into the Messianic kingdom. There's a clue it goes on to say, Isaiah says in 28, 16, 17, I'm paraphrasing, he says, don't be hasty with this covenant. Um, he says, you think you're going to build the temple, the, the measuring rod, the cornerstone. He starts listing all the things that would be an ingredient to build a temple. He says, don't be hasty because he's telling them the Messiah has already come and the chief cornerstone, uh, you know, the, the sure foundation, all those things in the New Testament that talked about Jesus Christ. He's telling them he's, those things have already come. So I think it's another reason why he's saying don't, don't, your temple's not sanctioned. And I think that's another clue why that's what the true content of the false covenant is. Wow. And so the the peace, obviously, you know, Ezekiel 38 talks about when they're regathered, you know, they're going to be living in peace, unwalled villages uh, when they're attacked uh, by the Gog Magog coalition. So the Psalm 83 war obviously has to be over by then. Is that correct? There are preconditions. And, and unless these preconditions are met, Ezekiel 38 can't happen. And Israel has to be brought back into the land, regathered. From, this is in Ezekiel 38, 7 through 12. Regathered from the nations, check mark, that's going on. In the latter years, check mark, we're in the latter years. Brought back from the sword of persecution, check mark. Into a land that had long been desolate, check mark. Those things are there, but those aren't the only preconditions. They must be a peaceful people dwelling tranquilly living in a land of unwalled villages. They must be dwelling securely without walls, bars, or gates. They must have silver and gold and acquired livestock and goods and possessing great plunder and booty because that's, of course, the motive of Russia's coalition of Ezekiel 38. Right. Unlike Psalm 83, they want to take the land of pastures of God for possession. Psalm 83, verse 12, Russia's coalition, separate coalition, following Psalm 83, they want to take the prosperity of Israel, their livelihood, their plunder, and their booty. Now, Ezekiel 38 can't happen just yet because Israel is not dwelling peacefully. We see that on the news every day right now with what's going on in Hamas and the skirmishes with Hezbollah to the north. They, they're not dwelling without walls, bars, nor gates. They've got a 403-mile wall coursing through the center of Israel proper, effectively keeping Palestinian terror outside from Israel proper. They've got walls to the north around Lebanon couple walls there. That's why Hezbollah is trying to build tunnels under them. They've got walls by the Gaza. That's why the Hamas will build tunnel networks under there. They've got walls down by the Sinai in Egypt. They've got walls even around Jordan. Matter of fact, Netanyahu recently touted he's going to fortify that wall even more around Jordan because they want to keep weapons smuggling that's coming through Jordan away from the West Bank. Matter of fact, Israel's is the most fenced in and fortified country in the world. Wow. And so they're not doing without walls, bars, nor gates. Matter of fact, they have to be dwelling securely also. He mentions that two times, and it's, the Hebrew words are yeshav v'tak. He mentions it twice. And it's not a security that's politically brokered. It's a security in his context uh, because you've defeated your enemies, and now you can dwell securely. Now you can tear down the walls, the security checkpoints, and things like that. And, and so we ask ourselves, well, when is Israel going to dwell securely? And I'm going to take the liberty to tell you in Ezekiel 28, 10 chapters earlier, he tells us exactly when. He says, Thus says the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered. We've seen that's been going on back in the land of Israel. And hallowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles. Then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. And they will dwell safely. Yishav v'tak, same Hebrew words. They'll build houses. They'll plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell securely. Yishav v'tak. When? when I execute judgments upon all those around them who despise them 
then they shall know I'm the Lord their God. Wow. The utter, the utter destruction of the nations that are out of compliance with God's roadmap plan that we talked about and His peace plan that we talked about at the beginning of this show. They're going to be utterly plucked up and destroyed. Judgments will be executed upon them because until that happens, Israel can't dwell securely and tear down the walls, bars, or gates. I, I love the way you explain things, Bill, because, you know, this is such a concerning situation that's happening. Jesus said that when the end came, there would be distress of nations with perplexity. And that's what we're seeing right now. There are no answers. There's distress of nations, wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, all this stuff, pestilences. And so what we're seeing obviously are the birth pains. But you, you have studied uh, this, the future wars. Uh, you know more about it than anybody that I know, honestly. You've written about it more than anybody that I know. And so one of the, you've said something several times during this show, and that is, th this is the way it is now, but this is going to change, and it will. We know the future in advance. We know that Jordan and Egypt are going to change. We know Iran's disposition. We know the future wars, you know, and, and you've done such a great job in your book talking about it. And there's so much more in your book than we've talked about on this show today, and I want to encourage people to go online. Now, Bill, where can people find more about your ministry and get their resources from you? Oh, yes, Jimmy, thank you. I invite them to come to our website, prophecydepot.com, prophecydepot, like homedepot.com. It's got, all, got an online store, books and DVDs. We have uh, all my articles. We also have connections to our YouTube site, and our, we have a daily news site we put called Prophecy Headlines. Keep up relative news daily, every day, what we think is prophetically relevant. So come to prophecydepot.com. I want to encourage you to go on there. And Bill, thank you so much. And I want, uh, you, you, you're a regular on the show here, but I want to have you back, uh, especially as the situation in Israel continues, because, you know, the, the future wars, we're going to see these things unfolding. And as they do, you know, uh, people have a lot of questions and you've got a lot of answers. And on October 7th, before October 7th, you came on this show and we were talking about the future wars, your book, and all the wars we're talking about today. The difference today is we're seeing the tectonic shift in Bible prophecy beginning on October 7th. Th this is something I've never seen in my lifetime. The level of anti-Semitism, the level of focus on Israel. And Israel's been a lot of the focus of you know, world diplomacy for many years. I've never seen anything like this every day in the news and all the nations of the world being polarized for and against Israel. And so this, again, I, I think that like you, this is going to continue to escalate. We'll see how soon we'll see all the developments. But thankfully, we have Bible prophecy to tell us the future in advance. Jimmy, I'd love to be on your program again. I, I really enjoy your show. Thank you for the invitation. Um, basically, I do want to also mention there are a lot of people who don't necessarily agree with what, I, what I've been saying about Psalm 83. They think it's mainly just a prayer or has been historically fulfilled. There are others who believe the Elam prophecy was fulfilled by Nebuchadnezzar back in the Babylonian era. Uh, that Some people think the Assyrians de destroyed Damascus in 732 B.C. But in the Future War Prophecies book, we've done... We've rebutted all those arguments. We've got appendixes and inside of the chapters explaining historical research and all the various reasons why these are legitimate future war prophecies that are yet unfulfilled. And also, Jimmy, we started the program by talking about God's compassionate peace plan. He wants none to perish. That's why he got the Arab states together for them. There are going to be remnants, like the Jewish remnant. There will be a faithful Jewish remnant. There will be remnants coming out of Iran, we're told, in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 39. Right. In order to restore the fortunes and bring back the captives of Elam. Why did God do this peace plan? I mean, he knew that this would be a nightmare. The Islam would be uh, embedded the ancient hatred. Why did he even bother to make Arab statehoods? Because he loves everyone. He loves right. those Arabs. He's going to have remnant uh, the, uh, from them as well. And matter of fact, in Iran, he's doing supernatural evangelism, dreams, visions, miracles, and healings, because he wants none to perish, Jimmy. I love it. Bill, thank you so much for being with me today, and I look forward to having you back soon. God bless you. Thanks, Jimmy. Thank all of you for joining me today on The Tipping Point Show. I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel. Stay tuned to endtimes.com. God bless you. Bye-bye. That was a great interview. I hope that you really enjoyed that. Hey, if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet on YouTube, go ahead and hit the subscribe button right there and also the like button. 
The subscribe button means you'll get everything that we put out on YouTube. It'll come to you automatically. The like button means more people will find out about what we're doing and you can help other people by doing that. Subscribe and like, and thank you for joining me today. We'll see you again next time. God bless you.